Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation for your future reference. And our Internet viewers and other online viewers are welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program this afternoon and welcoming our special guests is Lindsay Burke, who serves as our Will Skillman Fellow in Education Policy. She researches and writes on federal and state education issues, focusing on two critical areas of education policy, one of reducing the role in education of the federal government and empowering families with school choice. Her commentary and research and op-eds have appeared in various newspapers and magazines, and she has spoken on education reform issues across the country as well as internationally. She holds her bachelor's degree in politics from Hollins University and a master's in teaching in foreign language from the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Lindsay Burke. Lindsay. Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here today. We have a really exciting panel and uh, looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say today. So you're here today, so you probably have a pretty good understanding of how Common Core came to be. The federal carrots, race to the top, waivers from No Child Left Behind, the direct federal financing of the two national testing consortia. You're probably also aware of the many critiques that have been levied at the standards over the past few years. Federal interference in local school policy, the cost, poor mathematics sequencing using non-standard algorithms, the overemphasis on informational text. I mean, what high school kid could possibly resist reading the evolution of the grocery bag? Healthcare costs in McAllen, Texas, and Fed views, really exciting and captivating material. Parents and students alike are probably thrilled by the recommended reading list, which jettisons some great works of literature to make room for that classic government document, Executive Order 13423, strengthening federal, environmental, energy, and transportation management. That's a big part of the reason we're hearing parents voice opposition to Common Core. But even as they try to voice opposition, many parents feel as though they're not being heard. Heather Crossan, an Indiana mother who has been at the forefront of opposition to Common Core, uh, talked about her efforts in voicing her concerns to her principal at her daughter's local private parochial school. Again, this is a private school in Indiana. When the principal told Heather that her hands were tied about what he could do on curricula there, she says at that point she realized that not only had her daughter's curriculum left her local Catholic school, but it had left the state. That homogenization of curriculum, evidenced in part by the fact that Heather's daughter is at a private school, is perhaps one of the greatest concerns with Common Core. Now imagine you are a homeschooling family You've made the decision to homeschool. As a family, you've deliberated for months, if not longer. You've considered the benefits. You've considered the potential sacrifices. You've sought counsel from other family members, your church, internet forums, current homeschooling families. You're ready to take the leap to homeschool. So you withdraw your child from public school, and you begin your journey. And things are going great. And then one day, a few weeks pass, you get a letter from the assistant superintendent of your child's former public school. He mails you a copy of the school's homeschool policy and asks that you call him. You feel a bit like you've been called into the principal's office. This is exactly what has happened recently to one New Jersey family who decided to homeschool. The letter they received from the superintendent stated that they had to submit a letter of intent to homeschool that they must follow the New Jersey Common Core standards. Then they would have to wait for the superintendent to approve their curriculum and give them permission to homeschool. Thankfully, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which we'll hear from more today, stepped in and clarified things. The superintendent then told the family that their curriculum standards must merely uh, be guided 
by the New Jersey Common Core Standards, to which, again, HSLDA steps in and firmly explain that homeschooling families have no such duty to follow or be guided by the Common Core Standards. HSLDA attorney Scott Woodruff said that the school system eventually backed down after he pointed out that they had no such legal basis for that demand, but he did say that the district's actions show a rather troubling mindset, almost the assumption that, well, since we have to do Common Core, so should you. And this is the issue at the heart of critiques about Common Core. National standards and tests, by their very nature, have a homogenizing effect on education, even for those families who have chosen something different to be educated entirely outside of the public system. And there's mounting evidence, and I think for that reason, that Common Core is in trouble. There's now momentum in Tennessee and Wisconsin to repeal Common Core. North Carolina is undergoing a rewrite of the standards. Most notably this year, four states, Indiana, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and South Carolina, withdrew from Common Core altogether. If you talk to teachers, the folks who are on the front line of implementation, their support over the past year has declined precipitously from 76% to 46% in one year alone. So today, we're going to hear from an excellent panel of experts on the future of Common Core and what life after Common Core, if we're being optimistic, looks like. First, we'll hear from Neil McCluskey. Neil McCluskey is the Associate Director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom. Prior to arriving at Cato, McCluskey served in the US Army, taught high school English, and was a freelance reporter covering municipal government and education in suburban New Jersey. Dr. McCluskey is the author of the book, Feds in the Classroom, How Big Government Corrupts, Cripples, and Compromises American Education. McCluskey holds an undergraduate degree from Georgetown University, a master's degree in political science from Rutgers, and has a PhD in public policy from George Mason University. Next, we'll hear from William Estrada. Will is the director of the Federal Relations Department at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. He acts as HSLDA's representative on Capitol Hill, advocating for homeschoolers before Congress and federal departments. Estrada is a member of the US Supreme Court Bar and the California Bar. He serves on the board of Life Raft International, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping refugees in Thailand, and also serves on the board of the Good Samaritan Advocates, a nonprofit pro bono legal service organization in DC. A homeschool graduate himself, Mr. Estrada earned his Juris Doctorate at Oak Brook College of Law in Fresno, California. After Will, we will hear from Ted Rebarber, who is the CEO and founder of Accountability Works, a nonprofit education organization whose mission is to support states, schools, and parents in implementing research-based practices and high-quality education assessment and accountability systems. Prior to uh, moving to Accountability Works, Rebarber was co-founder and chief executive education officer of Advantage Schools, Inc., a charter school management company. He worked on standards-based reform and research-based practices at the US Department of Education under President George H.W. Bush. He is a graduate of Wesleyan University in Connecticut. After that, we'll hear from, in reverse order there, Stanley Kurtz on the end. Stanley Kurtz is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and contributing editor at National Review Online. Dr. Kurtz focuses on a wide range of issues, including K-12 and higher education reform, and is, has published two influential books on President Obama's political history and policy agenda. Dr. Kurtz received his undergraduate degree from Haverford College and his PhD from Harvard. He later taught at Harvard, winning several teaching awards for his work in a great books program. Dr. Kurtz was also the Dewey Prize lecturer in psychology at the University of Chicago. And last but not least, we will hear from Bill Evers. Dr. Williamson Evers is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and a member of the institution's core task force on K-12 education, specializing in research on education policy, especially as it pertains to curriculum, teaching, testing, accountability, and school finance from kindergarten through high school. Dr. Evers was the former United States Assistant Secretary of Education for Policy from 2007 until 2009. 
and he served as the Iraq, in, in Iraq as a senior advisor for education to a minister, L. Paul Bremer, of the Coalition Provisional Authority. Dr. Evers received his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in political science from Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, I want to thank uh, Heritage Foundation for putting this together, hosting today, Lindsay especially, uh, for all the wor uh, work she did putting this together. Uh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to quickly, some of you may have heard this before, but I'm, it's really important to remember. I'm going to quickly go through the history of federal education. And I think when you know that history and when you see it quickly presented, you'll see that the trajectory of Common Core is exactly what Proponents of Common Core tell us it isn't, which is we're going directly to a federal curriculum. It's clear when you see the tra trajectory, this is where we're going. And of course, if you look at the Common Core and you see that it's not just standards, you can see uh, very concretely that's where we're going. But this trajectory, I think, is really important to understand. So I'm going to do as fast as possible so that you can get to the far more interesting and more knowledgeable speakers who come after me. So the first thing you need to know is you start the colonial period and really you go to 1830s. Education is something that is expected to occur in the home, in voluntary communities, in religious communities, and it's something that government just generally, and especially not a national government, but government in generally isn't thought to have much of a role. In New England, you see a little bit of a role. Outside of New England, you see almost no role. And that is crucial to understand. I'm not going to get into all the specifics here. But until about 1830, the beginning of the common school movement, that's what education is. It's something that's based in civil society and families and communities. Then you get to the 1830s. I'm sure you all know who Horace Mann is. Of course, he's sort of the father of the common schools. Obviously, there was talk about having some sort of government provision of education before that, but he's really the prime mover, and he moves it in particular in Massachusetts. Interestingly, while this was not his only justification for moving to government provision of somewhat largely uniform schooling, he looked at places like Prussia and uh, France and the Netherlands and said, look, these places have nationalized education. It seems to help you know, society work kind of efficiently, and that's part of what we're after. So you could see even the beginning of this, looking to say, well, what can we do to have some sort of national uh, system of education that connects us in some way to our nation? Not to say that what he wanted was ultimately federal control, but this is already, you see the germs of this. It's not though until 1960, or 1867 rather, that you get to a first major federal step uh, toward education. And that is 1867, you actually have the first, the creation of the first U.S. Department of Education. Everybody thinks that started in the 1979, really 1980, uh, voted for in 1979. But we did have it in 1867, but within two years, it is downgraded to just uh, um, a Bureau of Education, and basically all it does is collect statistics. It's not supposed to be in any way contr controlling education. And then you've got to go almost an entire century after, again, 1867, before you see a major federal move into education. And that is the 1958 National Defense Education Act. Of course, at least they're still trying to have some constitutional justification by saying, look, this is connected to defense, something the Constitution gives the federal government authority to be involved in. But in any event, it is the first time it gets heavily involved, particularly in higher ed, but also in K through 12, driven, I think you've heard this before, largely by STEM issues. We need more scientists, more engineers, better mathematicians. Um, and at the time that this law was being debated, Barry Goldwater, Senator Goldwater, said something very prophetic. He said, if adopted, this legislation will mark the inception of aid, supervision, and ultimately control of education in this country by federal authorities. I think we're looking at that right now, as I intimated. But let's keep going through the timeline here. You then get to 1965, and that's the first time that the federal government says, we will involve ourselves in education outside of a, an explicit defense connection. And that's the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Importantly, they didn't say this was about control or anything like that. It was just about compensatory funding, trying to equalize resources between poor districts and rich districts. 
1979, then, you get the creation of the Department of Education, largely at the behest of the National Education Association. It had just become a teacher's union, a very big teacher's union, and they said, we'll throw our support behind somebody running for president, of course. Uh, then candidate Jimmy Carter said, well, I'll, I'll get you a federal Department of Education. This, now you see how concentrated, or how power is being concentrated in Washington. 1983, now, you know, 1983, this is after President Le uh, Reagan is elected. He tries to get rid of the Department of Education. Uh, really, the Republicans in the Senate have no stomach to revisit this debate, which they just had. And then his first Secretary of Education, Terrell Bell, puts together a commission that ultimately publishes something called A Nation at Risk. You've probably all heard of this report, which famously intoned that had a uh, foreign power done to us, what we've done to ourselves, our education system, we'd have considered it an act of war. This now moves the moral focus of education toward Washington. People begin to look to Washington, D.C. to say, help us, guide us, tell us what to do. How do we fix this thing that is crippling us? And the uh, appointment of Bill Bennett as the next Secretary of Education, who's a very, uh, very magnetic personality, uh, very uh, happy to use the bully pulpit, even moves that moral focus even more to Washington. Then we have to understand in 1988, the ESEA reauthorization requires for the first time that states define achievement levels for federally supported students and ID schools where students are not making acceptable progress. So now we've seen first the federal government funds, then over time people realize we're getting nothing for that money, and then the federal government controls. He who pays the piper calls the tune. We also see continuing to move the moral focus toward Washington. 1989, uh, President George H.W. Bush calls the Charlottesville Education Summit, sort of gathers the governors to all get together to talk about a national strategy for education. To 1990, they create the National Education Goals. These are broad goals, aspirational goals, but for the first time saying, let's as a nation have one set of educational goals. 1991, you get to America 2000, President Bush and then Secretary of Education Lamar Alexander includes a proposal for national standards in five subjects, voluntary exams, and state and district and school report cards. Now, this didn't pass, but you see the beginning of where we are now, and it's from a Republican administration saying we need to have, from the top, pushing of specific standards and specific tests. 1994, you have Goals 2000, now under President Clinton. Uh, that includes a small incentive, so money, a money incentive, sounds like race to the top, although this was smaller than race to the top, to get states to adopt these voluntary standards and assessments. And of course, this money is money that comes from taxpayers, and taxpayers, as we know, live in states. So it's not as if the federal government just miracled money together that didn't come from people and then say, you can have some of this. They were saying, you want some of your money back, you do what we tell you to do. It got worse, though, because the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was reauthorized again, called the Improving America School Act at that point. Um, and it was going to link adoption of these voluntary standards and tests to your ability to get Title I funds. It was ultimately gutted because in 1994, of course, the Republicans sweep in historical uh, move into Congress and to the majority, and they get rid of something called NEZIC, which was going to be the group that really said whether or not a state was in compliance with this. And then those national standards, their national standards and uh, that, um, that uh, Secretary Alexander had used discretionary money to fund, and those come out. In particular, the history standards come out, and if any of you remember back then, the history standards were pretty much reviled by the entire country, which really kind of put the kibosh on an overt move to national standards for some time. Um, then you get to 2001, and of course 2001 is the debate over the No Child Left Behind Act, which is passed in January 2002, and this for the first time has the federal government dictate what the structure of the education system will be in this entire country. And they say, you will have state standards, and you will have state tests, and you will have state tests during all these years. And you will come up with adequate yearly progress goals, and you will break out your scores by subgroups of students. This is saying, we are now telling you, Washington is telling you, how education will be structured. What it didn't do is say exactly what will be taught. 
that, and they left it to states to come up with their own standards, their own tests, and their own definition of proficiency. But this is part one of really two parts of a federal takeover. And what we found, of course, was that states set pretty low standards, easy tests, low definitions of proficiency. And so in 2008, really a couple of years before that, but 2008 is the important year, you have the National Governor Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers. And now many of you probably know this Common Core history. They say, okay, let's bring people together and we'll see if we can come up with some sort of common standard that supposedly people, states, can voluntarily adopt. But in 2008, they publish a report called Benchmarking for Success. And this is crucial. Benchmarking for Success calls for common national standards, but standards whose adoption is incentivized by the federal government for money and regulatory relief. This is important because this predates President Obama. You'll often hear from Common Core supporters, well, this was always supposed to be state-led and voluntary, and what happened was President Obama, unwanted, just barged in and interfered with this whole thing. Well, that's not true. This report said very clearly the federal government's job was to incentivize adoption, and this was before there was a President Obama. And that's because, I think rightly, there was an expectation that states would not voluntarily adopt high standards or tough tests, and I think we'd seen that in most cases. And so you can understand the rationale. Unstated, unfortunately, but still the rationale. Who, what's the only entity that can force states to do things? It's the federal government, even though it's not supposed to in education. And so, of course, the expectation was the federal government would have to cajole states into doing what they otherwise wouldn't do themselves. Uh, in any event, July 2009, uh, the Department of Education, of course, announces Race to the Top, which, as you all know, uh, called for states to be evaluated on a whole set of things that the Obama administration wanted them to do. And one of them was to adopt common standards, and those were standards that were common to a majority of states. That's how you maximized your points in the standards portion. And there was only one standard that met that requirement. So it wasn't stated specifically in the regulations, but everybody knew what it was. It was Common Core. And in fact, now uh, there was uh, some reporting done by the Washington Post a few months ago that found look, there were people who were advocates of the Common Core who were working with the Obama administration, telling them, you need to include this in Race to the Top. And of course, soon after Race to the Top, 45 states quickly adopt because it's the low point of the recession and they want money. Um, finally, then, you get to September 2011. Understanding Race to the Top was a one-shot deal. There have been subsequent races to the top, but they haven't dealt with the same things. So you have states that win money. They get the money for four years. Well, what do you do with states that didn't win the money or when the states have used up the money? This is when you get the regulatory relief that was called for a benchmarking for success. If states want out of the no child left behind requirements, especially the requirement that all students be proficient by 2014, well, they have to do what the administration says in order to get a waiver from the law, noting that the law itself doesn't say that the administration can connect conditions to the granting of waivers. It only says it can grant waivers. So this is all illegal. In my estimation, people get mad when I say that, but I don't see any way around it. Regardless, when it comes to the Common Core, the effect was then to say, look, states, now you are locked into the Common Core because it only gave you two options on standards, either Common Core or you could have a state college system certify your own state standards as college career ready. But note, this was after Race to the Top when most, the vast majority of states said, sure, we'll adopt the Common Core. So they were already saying they would use the Common Core. This locked them in. So where are we going? What's the future of Common Core? Well, I, I sort of uh, gave you a hint on this. It's ultimately toward federal control. Now, a lot of people think, oh, well, this is you're wearing a tinfoil hat. If you think that in any way, this is leading toward uh, federal control of the curriculum or any sort of federal micromanagement of education, but you can look even before the Common Core. You could see the federal government saying, look, we're gonna incentivize states to create these P through 20W databases, where you're gonna keep data on people from pre-kindergarten all the way to their workforce. And what's the purpose of that? Well, if you follow the higher education debates, at the very least, it's to say, we need the data so we can control for all sorts of variables and then say, this school's good, this school's bad, this one's okay, this one's awful. Clearly, the goal, the intent for many people 
is to collect enough data so that the federal government can start to make judgments about which schools are good, which are bad, and which should have money followed, P kids, or just go directly to these particular schools. Um, and then everybody probably knows this, but why is this a bad thing? It's a bad thing because we know pretty clearly, for one thing, having national standards does not lead to better outcomes. There's a fair amount of research on this, not a whole lot, but a fair amount, and none of it supports the notion that you need national standards to get better outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to have the debate about that research because Race to the Top said adopt these things before anybody knows it and before they're even finally written. Um, but we also know from evidence both inside education and outside, what does work is not centralization and control, it's freedom. It's freedom that unleashes competition, it's competition that drives innovation. I want to get people to come to me because I can do something more efficiently and for less money than somebody else can. Uh, and it leads to specialization. One of the things that's lost in the Common Core discussion is the fact that all kids are different. The idea that there should be one monolithic standard that everybody should move at the same rate makes no sense once you've met more than one child in your life. Um, and then the other thing is real accountability, immediate accountability comes from freedom, choice, your ability to leave a provider that's not giving you what you want and take your business elsewhere. That's why there, there are a lot of recommendations for what to do when states get rid of the Common Core, what should they do? Now, of course, the immediate problem is you do need to fill it in with some sort of standard because, one, that's what the system is based in, and because the federal government is saying if you don't put something in there, you can lose access to lots of federal money. But ultimately, the solution to this is not more centralized standard even at, either at the state or local level, although certainly that's better than at the federal level, but it is to move to school choice for everyone educator freedom so they can try different things, so they can focus on the needs of unique, unique subsets of kids, and then attaching money to kids so they can seek out those providers that are best for the unique needs of that child. Ultimately, we have moved in exactly the wrong direction. We don't need centralization at the national level. We need to move to complete decentralization so we can treat children as what they are, which is unique individuals. Thanks. I'm Will Estrada with Homeschool Legal Defense, and the fascinating thing is that the Common Core is good for homeschooling. Now, before Jeb Bush and Checker Finn and David Coleman run with that as their lead, what do I mean by that? In 1999, the National Center for Education Statistics found that there were 850,000 homeschool students in the United States. Thirteen years later, in 2012, the National Center for Education Statistics an arm of the Department of Education found that there were 1.8 million homeschool students in the United States. Now homeschooling is growing and as those of us who have been fighting the Common Core know, 2012 is about the time when the Common Core began to be implemented and all of a sudden this kind of abstract ivory tower idea was being foisted upon kids and families in the public schools of states that had adopted the Common Core. Although we do not have hard numbers from the Department of Education, what we have seen is homeschooling is skyrocketing. In uh, just a few months ago on Breitbart News, Susan Berry reported on March 27, 2014, that in Alabama, growing numbers of families are choosing to homeschool their children, in part because of concerns about the Common Core in their states. Uh, the Daily Signal reported recently, I think it was on September 8, 2014, by Genevieve Wood, that in North Carolina, where numbers are starting to come out for the 2013-2014 school year, they have seen a massive increase in the amount of students who are being homeschooled over the previous year. The numbers were that they now have 60,950 homeschools in the 2013-14 school year, a 14.3% increase from the prior year. There are now almost 100,000 homeschool students in North Carolina. Now why is this? Uh, let me grab my PowerPoint presentation here. And the reason is as uh, we can see in the PowerPoint, this was a recent article in Politico about the moms winning the battle of the Common Core, and I love the first sentence. It said, the millions have proven no match for the moms. Moms and dads, parents, whether in public schools, in private schools, or in home schools, they are frustrated for the exact same reasons that Neil outlined, that they're losing local control over their education of their children. They're losing the ability to do something as simple and as American as homework with their kids, and they're voting with their feet. 
They're leaving the public schools. They're trying to fight the battle to repeal the Common Core in their states. Failing to do that, they're leaving the public schools and they're heading to the homeschools. So I jokingly said that uh, the Common Core is great for homeschooling. Yes, our numbers are increasing. We're seeing that at homeschool legal defense. We're seeing that in the news. We're going to see more of those statistics. But the danger out there is now that the Common Core, as it's pushed towards a national curriculum, as Neil said, as our other panelists are going to talk about, is going to threaten the foundation of homeschooling. Here's why. If ever our nation truly adopts a one-size-fits-all, nationalized approach to education, obviously it's going to start in the public schools. There's language in federal law in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that says that nothing in the act will apply to homeschools or private schools that do not receive federal funds. These are, right now, just applying to the public schools. But one day, if we have a nationalized, one-size-fits-all approach to education, policymakers will say, why are those homeschoolers not taking the same tests? Why are those private schoolers not taking the same tests? How do we we know if they're actually getting a good education and we will see that freedom that we've come to know and love in homeschooling in private schooling be eroded some of the other concerns that we're seeing are the tests the SAT the ACT the PSAT being realigned to the common core will homeschoolers be disadvantaged even though they've gotten an excellent education at this point, you know, uh, it appears that these tests are being dumbed down, and we think that homeschoolers, homeschool students will do well, but that concern is out there, and it's a real concern. Then there's the concern from school districts misinterpreting these, these policies, as Lindsay said in the beginning, Westfield, New Jersey, which was trying to force homeschoolers who are independent of the public school to follow the Common Core. We were able to chase them back, to uh, tell them what the law is. They backed off of that outrageous demand. But that's what we have in store for us if we truly are to nationalize our education. And then we've got databases. Many of the same people who are concerned about the Common Core are also concerned about this parallel rise of the loss of control over your students' privacy. This up on our slide is an actual slide that was presented in Orlando, Florida in 2011. This was the Council of Chief State School Officials, their annual conference. Many of you who are involved in this battle know that the CCSSO was heavily involved, along with the National Governors Association, along with Achieve Incorporated, along with other organizations in pushing the Common Core. And I want to bring your attention down to uh, the, uh, the uh, next to the last bullet point. They're making their recommendations for how to improve their statewide databases. And then, again, with the goal of having national databases in bloom, which uh, kind of blew up, was one of them. But what they say up there is include student groups not now included, e.g. homeschooled, in the data system. There is a push when it comes to centralized education to include all students homeschool, public school, and private school in these databases, in this approach towards standardizing education. My friends, many people are leaving the public schools because they think that they can be free of the Common Core. And yes, they are, but we must fight this battle now. We're all in this together, public school, private school, homeschoolers, to fight the nationalization, the standardization of education, and to ensure that children are able to get the quality education, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, the right of parents to direct the education and upbringing of their children is a fundamental right. It's what the Supreme Court said in 1925, if we lose control over what our children are being taught, then we're, we've lost that fundamental right forever. The sequence has worked out really well because the, the two previous uh, presentations, which are excellent, really set up what I wanted to talk about. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about how we got to where we are. I'm not going to reach as far back as, as Neil did, uh, the 19th century, but I do want to talk about recent history because it's really important uh, for, not, for not only understanding where we are, but where we can go next, which I think is the, the, uh, the critical question that we need to answer. Um, the re reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Act, which uh, drives uh, uh, what public schools do, elementary and high schools do today, uh, inordinately, uh, but it does drive it, uh, has been hung up for years. They haven't been able to reauthorize it. They, they just maintain it the way it is. Uh, in theory, have these sunsets that require reauthorization, but in practice, they can just delay that. But the reason it hasn't been reauthorized for quite some time is because there's a, the policy consensus on what we need to do um, has broken down. Uh, Common Core is, has, has broken that down. 
there's opposition from Republicans to it. Uh, not all Democrats support it. There's basically a lack of direction, uh, unlike the consensus that was there, at least at the federal level, with No Child Left Behind um, uh, under the Bush administration, which was the culmination of, of what happened, uh, what I would say since the late 80s, early 90s. Um, at that point, we saw the, the, the launch of the modern uh, curriculum standards and testing movement, the policy reforms that have led to where we are today with, with Common Core. Um, there were two intellectual um, models that were, that were uh, proposed for why we should have standards and testing at the state level. Uh, one of them uh, was pushed by a fellow named Chester Finn, Checker Finn, and it was sold to conservatives that we need, if we're going to have choice, we need consumers to be informed choosers. That in any market, you have to be able to make informed choice, and that's what makes a market effective. Uh, and that's, that's and, and at the time, conservatives were really pushing, and libertarians were pulling, pushing school choice. But because of this sort of market language, they bought into the state standards and testing movement. Uh, but the other intellectual model for standards and testing, uh, which is the one that actually got implemented, not, not the, the Finn uh, description, was by a fellow named Mike Smith, Marshall Smith. And his model was what's called systemic reform. And the idea behind his model was that standards, curriculum standards specifically, are the fulcrum around which uh, policy elites, uh, at that time uh, still thinking at the state level, could create excellence in the classroom by, by using uh, various policy levers and knobs uh, like testing, teacher preparation, um, uh, teacher evaluation, teacher training, uh, goals and timetables with state accountability formulas for what exactly what students ought to be able to achieve on the test, what percentage of students ought to meet on what test or what average gains ought to be. All these policy levers would be used at the state level to, to create excellence in the classroom and at the school level. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a top-down central planning model. Uh, it is the model that drives instruction in most schools, in many schools, uh, in public school districts, if you talk to most teachers, if you talk to many parents, uh, that's the model that won, not uh, informed choice. It's, it's the blueprint for how schools should operate and classrooms should operate, not a check, an uh, accountability check at the end. That's, that's what actually won. Um, that's what we got. Now, the result of that uh, was that we, 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 the No Child Left Behind Act, the feds were involved in pushing this, tying the uh, elementary and secondary act funds to adopting this, still at the state level because, as, as Neil pointed out, the initial push for national testing, national standards, which I was at the Department of Education for and worked on, by the way, so I'm a recovering um, central planner. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, we didn't think it was central planning then, but it was. But anyway, so, so, um, so, the, the, the state model, uh, the reason we're doing Common Core is because state central planning, state socialism failed, okay? Uh, you had some states that got some results, but when you look at the results by the end of the uh, Bush administration, beginning of the Obama administration, the general achievement levels on tests like the National Assessment, NAEP, any metric you want, they're nowhere near overall where we wanted them to be. We didn't see the large improvements, the large gains uh, that, that were predicted under that model. And so what's the solution if, if central planning at the state level didn't work? Well, let's do it at a federal level, right? Let's do it bigger. Maybe it'll work if we impose it on everybody in one monolithic model. Does that make any logical sense that anybody here would buy? No. But that is the logical result of that model. When it didn't work, now I should say there were individual states where there were improvements. Massachusetts got some improvements. So I'm not actually trying to suggest that no state should do um, uh, state standards and testing, but I'm just going to suggest something a little different. But as a model for reforming education nas nationwide, it didn't work. That's why we're here. Um, the other thing I want to mention about that is, is parents hated it. A lot of parents hate it. They do not like what they view as test-driven schooling, test-driven reform. A lot of teachers don't like it either. Uh, if, it's, if, if it's this week in the school year, a lot of, uh, you walk in a lot of classrooms in, in the U.S. right now, we're working on this standard. 
This is the standard we're doing this week. Next week, we're working on this standard. What are these standards? These are statements if students shall be able to do this or that. Now, sometimes they're fairly narrow, like students know how to use, you know, onomatopoeia and, you know, an English literary analysis or whatever it is. And you can do that in a few days. Sometimes they're... Students will comprehend challenging literary works from diverse, you know, cultures. They're these incredibly broad, challenging standards that are the heart of the whole curriculum, right? So to make to make it sense, to make sense, do that this week, you know, really doesn't make sense because standards are not written as a blueprint for curriculum, but that's how they're being used, and that's how they're actually they're all kind of data systems and instructional uh, software that helps uh, schools do that. Regardless of the particular way they do it, it drives instruction. Parents don't like it, and they're right, and a lot of teachers don't like it. Now, now parents aren't against testing, right? You, you ask in polls, do you support testing, and they do. So how do, we, how do we square that circle? What does that paradox mean? Okay, well, parents like testing when it's used the way it's been used historically in private schools and in homeschooling. When it's a standardized test or another test, quality test, it doesn't drive everything you do throughout the curriculum. But parents can use that with all the other information they have about their child, with the conversations they have with their teachers, with everything they know, and make a judgment about how their child is doing. And if things are not improving the way they want, they can ultimately make that choice, the idea of choice, to go to another private school, take their child. So that type of testing parents like. But when you have accountability formulas at the state level, that judge schools, that judge teachers, where your child is a decimal point in that formula in, in judging this school. And that's what's actually driving instruction. That's what's actually the 800-pound gorilla that's driving public education. Parents don't like it because it doesn't necessarily work for their child. It actually doesn't even work necessarily work for their school. Uh, when I was managing charter schools, uh, we, had, uh, we focused on disadvantaged students. And we actually had chartering entities tell us uh, you know, you really ought to bring in some middle class and some white kids because your kids are starting really far behind. And so if you focus just on these disadvantaged students, you're not going to get the percentage of kids at the cut score, which is very high, and we get kids three or four years behind in middle school. And so you're, we're going to have to take away your charter. Um, I also worked with a state uh, that designed their plan for No Child Left Behind. We had the state superintendent, the business community, the uh, principal association, and I helped them work on their plan. And, the, and when they understood what it meant, the head of the principal's association said, if you're really serious about this with all those breakouts that Neil talked about for disabled kids, special ed kids, 100%, including severely cognitively disabled kids, supposed to be proficient. If you're serious about this, long before you get to 100%, we're going to create schools where we're going to put a lot of special ed kids and we'll all expect them to fail, but that's how we're going to maneuver the numbers so that we can meet your goals and timetables, okay? Now, sometimes they were able to pull that off, sometimes they weren't, but the bottom line is goals and timetables uh, by bureaucrats, to central planning, you know, it actually sounds a little familiar. I, I actually came to this country from East Bloc uh, State back when we used to have the Soviet Union. They had five-year plans. They had goals and timetables. They always met the goals and timetables for their economy, but it actually didn't work very well. So, so this model doesn't work. This central plan model doesn't work. Uh, now, I want to I just uh, mention uh, one more thing, and then I want to get quickly to the solution. Um, Common Core is often sold as this is just the outcomes. We don't really tell you how you should teach and all that. This is not curriculum, they claim, but it really is. It's really mostly about the methods. Uh, in large part. So I'm going to give you two quick examples. Andrew Porter, a scholar um, who supported the idea of Common Core and who believed in a philosophy, which is progressivist, instructional progressivism, that really drives a lot of it, uh, analyzed the, the Common Core standards. And, and uh, Common Core also claims to be benchmarked on what's worked in top achieving countries like Singapore and other countries. And one of the things he found was in top achieving countries at the eighth grade level in math, 75% of the curriculum or standards is on actually doing math. Common Core, 38% is on actually doing math, and their emphasis is on talking about math. Okay, this is progressivist instruction in sort of modern form. Uh, but it's not based on international uh, standards at work. Another quick point, standard algorithms at the lower elementary grades. Uh, Common Core, in, in Singapore, for example, and this is the model that all top achieving countries do, they teach a standard algorithm early. This is for addition and subtraction, uh, grade one. 
Um, they start with 100, uh, with numbers in the 100, two-digit two digit numbers. They, they increase it to three-digit numbers by second grade, and then uh, four-digit numbers in third grade. They do it gradually. They teach conceptual understanding as well as, as computational fluency. Common Core doesn't do that, even though it claims to be internationally benchmarked. It delays the standard algorithm, mastery of the standard algorithm, until fourth grade in addition and subtraction. Fourth grade. So what is it doing until then? Before that, it has students doing what they call non-standard approaches. And they have to actually become fluent, practiced, really fluent uh, in these non-standard approaches uh, based on place value, which are designed to teach conceptual knowledge. So they spend years with these other approaches, and then wham, fourth grade, all of a sudden you're supposed to be proficient in a standard algorithm. This is progressivist instruction. Now, do I think it's bad? Personally, yes, but as having run schools. But the bottom line is, these are exactly the kinds of things that are the core of what schools are doing, what, what you teach and how you teach it. These are the kinds of things that schools ought to be able to differentiate themselves on and offer parents a choice. And, and compete and see, to see which one works. I think, I know what I think would work, but, but my views shouldn't dominate. We ought to have real choice where you don't have a monolithic set of curriculum standards that drive everybody in how they do everything. So quickly, uh, solution. It's what I would call the constitutional solution uh, because it, it, it's really based on our Constitution. And I'll be brief. Um, scholar, uh, legal scholar Michael Grieva, who's here in D.C., uh, wrote recently, we actually have not too little, but far too much federalism of the wrong kind. A federalism that makes government bigger, more responsible, and less accountable. We need less of that federalism and more federalism of the right kind. Now, what does that mean, right? When we think of federalism, we think we know what it means usually. Well, think about the fact that Common Core wasn't entirely a federal position. Neil was right, the feds were there from the beginning, but you had states, governors, Chief state school officers, they were in on the ground floor. They were saying, yes, give it to us. Tell us what to do. We'll do it all. They, they, they got all together. Uh, that's what I would call cartel federalism. It's collusion to create one uniform curriculum standards across the country. Um, now, what's the, what's the constitutional form of federalism? That's what, uh, I'll give you a brief quote from Justice Brandeis. It's about laboratories of democracy. And people know that part, but there's a second part to it. A state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel and social, social and economic experiments, here's the part, without risk to the rest of the country. People often forget that second part. So the bottom line is not just they try different things, but one can try one thing, somebody else can try another thing, and they don't impose it on everybody else. So just because there were states getting together doesn't make it federalism. Uh, a state colluding with the federal government to impose one monolithic curriculum standards in the country is not federalism. Uh, even if the feds weren't involved, we, the, the, the constitutional form of federalism is competitive federalism, competitive federalism, where states compete. Uh, if, if one approach works in one state, that draws attention, workers, wealth, <coughs> et cetera. The, the models at work uh, do not. Um, and so I think we need to remove the federal straitjacket that you see in Title I that you see in a bunch of these laws, this is what the feds can do. Uh, right now, you have federal law saying you must do this top-down model at the state level. If it's working in Massachusetts, great. Maybe it's working in a few other states, that's great. Most states, it didn't work. Parents don't like it. I would hope they could allow. You're still going to have some testing, but we should allow states to uh, create a list of quality tests. You're still going to have some testing because there's public dollars. Let schools school systems choose the curriculum standards and tests that fit their approach, let charter schools do it, choose the approach that fits their model, and let's have competition. Uh, and that will work, create competition within states. It will also create better competition across states. And this is my final point. One of, the, one of the common core arguments that actually has some value, and we shouldn't dismiss every argument from our opponents because that's not the right way to think about it. They've gotten buy-in from some in the business community because they've sold this, that you can create national efficiencies. Curriculum, small providers now don't have to worry about 50 different curriculums in 50 states. They can market and create a market across the country. You don't need to create one monolithic curriculum to do that. If you have states allowing a variety of curriculum and aligned tests that locals can choose from, you'll probably see some of those same models adopted in other states. You'll have charter management companies which like 
national curriculum, by the way, because then they don't have to come up with a different one in every state. Um, and same with testing companies and providers. If they can um, uh, market their model in multiple states, but there are other choices, everybody else can choose, and there might be models that are only in a specific state, you create competition. Instead of states mandating a single model in their geographic area, you, you, they, they ensure quality, but you get real meaningful choice. Otherwise, you're choosing between different schools or all doing the same thing. Okay, thanks to the battle over the College Board's sweeping and ideologically charged revisions to its APUS history exam, our national debate over the Common Core is entering a new phase. Here's what's changing. First, it's clear now that we're not just talking about English and math anymore. The entire curriculum is being nationalized. Second, the concern going back to the founders that nationalizing our education system would risk handing control to a single ideological faction is no longer theoretical. It is happening right now. The College Board has transformed its AP US history program into a radically revisionist, heavily left-leaning rendering of the American story, making uh, the traditional perspective next to impossible to teach. And the new history test is only the beginning of the College Board's transformative plans. Third, it is now becoming evident that the Common Core itself is only part of a larger effort to nationalize our education system. That effort is concerted and coordinated, yet it extends beyond any single political, administrative, uh, corporate, or nonprofit boundary. Above all, we need to understand the role that the College Board is now playing and intends to play in the effort to nationalize America's education system. Let's first consider the question of which subjects fall under the purview of the Common Core. While the Common Core is meant to have implications for teaching uh, and reading, uh, I'm sorry, teaching, the teaching of reading and writing in the sciences, in social studies, and in technical classes, for the most part, Common Core is about English and math. That is why it is so important that Common Core's architect, David Coleman, has become president of the College Board. Under Coleman's leadership, the College Board has begun to radically redesign all of its advanced placement exams, not just AP US history. Ultimately, this will include subjects like physics, world history, European history, US government and politics, and art history, in addition to AP US history. So in effect, Common Core covers English and math, while the College Board's AP subjects cover most of the rest of the curriculum. To give you an, <clears throat> an example of how this works, consider that David Conley, an important supporter of Common Core, in his just published book on Common Core, explicitly notes that history and social studies are the very last subject areas likely to be formally included in the Common Core. To explain the absence of history and social studies from the Common Core, Conley points to the 1990s controversy over the national history standards, which were scuttled when former National Endowment for the Humanities head uh, Lynn Cheney and virtually the entire United States Senate condemned these standards as ideologically biased. It is of considerable interest then that David Conley now advises the College Board on its AP US history program. In other words, by forcing revisions on the teaching of US history through the College Board, Common Core supporters like Conley have found, uh, and like David Coleman, have found a backdoor way to seize control of subjects that would be too hot to handle if formally labeled Common Core. Again, Common Core covers English and math, the College Board's AP exams cover just about everything else. By moving over to the College Board and dramatically expanding the curricular guidance provided to teachers of AP courses, David Coleman can effectively nationalize most of the curriculum, yet in a way that insulates him from public accountability. By the way, have you seen David Coleman lately? As far as I can tell, he's been ducking the press 
when the left-leaning magazine Mother Jones tried to interview him for a story on the APUS history controversy in September, Coleman declined to speak. Quote, I don't mean to be rude, Coleman told Mother Jones, but I have to obey my comms team or they'll kill me, end quote. <laughs> this prompted Mother Jones to note how unusual it was that the formerly media-friendly Coleman should be shunning interviews. Might this have something to do with the fact that the presence of the Common Core's architect at the center of a high-profile APUS history controversy would make the logic of his sweeping curriculum grab just a little bit too obvious. The College Board's supporters, not to mention its communications team, have been at pains to downplay Coleman's role in the AP exam changes. We're often told, for example, that the new APUS history curriculum was largely in place before Coleman took the helm at the College Board. But this is misleading. Most obviously, David Coleman is the president of the College Board right now. There is an intense controversy over the Board's new APUS history framework. If Coleman wanted to, he could withdraw that framework immediately. Not only has he declined to do so, but he is moving forward with plans to transform all of the College Board's remaining AP exams. Obviously, Coleman is completely supportive of these changes. It's also of interest that the APUS history redesign process began in 2006 and 2007, and then was abruptly suspended for years. Some participants in those early revisions believed that the entire project was dead after 2008. So how did it come about that the APUS history redesign was revived and rolled out only under the College Board's new president, David Coleman? It's hard to imagine that Coleman didn't know when he was hired that he would be presiding over an aggressive AP redesign process. And it's easy to imagine that Coleman may have been hired in part precisely because of his interest in managing an initiative that would grant the College Board effective control over much of the nation's curriculum. Any way you slice it, and despite his efforts to run from the obvious, David Coleman, the architect of the Common Core, is busy nationalizing K-12 education in this country from his perch at the College Board. It's important that we not lose sight of what's happening here in a haze of semantics. No doubt we'll be told that APUS history is not formally part of the Common Core. That is merely an evasion. Like all the other evasions Common Core advocates have thrown up to obscure the federal power grab that's been driving Common Core. Lawrence Chirap, who headed the APUS history redesign process, has publicly stated that the new APUS history framework is consistent with the fundamental principles of the Common Core. I've already noted that prominent Common, common Core supporter David Conley has been advising the College Board on its APUS history program. The College Board also recently brought on Stephanie Sanford to serve as Chief of Global Policy and Advocacy. After Sanford previously served as Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Gates Foundation, where she played a leading role, what a coincidence, in advocating for the Common Core. In other words, the Common Core crew has moved over to the College Board, and that crew by any other name would smell as pungent. So how are we to respond to a situation in which key supporters of the Common Core are making an end run, not only around the ordinary channels of state and local government, but even around the formal confines of the Common Core itself, to effectively nationalize an ideologically biased version of the most highly charged subjects in the curriculum. First, we need to bring the College Board and the AP redesign process into the center of the debate over Common Core. The distinction between Common Core and the AP redesign effort is artificial and only serves to insulate the College Board from public accountability. Second, we need to bring the problem of ideological bias into the center of the debate over Common Core. This is no longer a theoretical danger in the distant future, but a damaging present reality. Third, we need to take steps on both the state and federal levels to break the College Board's monopoly on advanced placement testing. After all, even the Common Core, which is far too nationalized as it is, has two testing consortia, yet the College Board is the only company to offer advanced placement testing. And as of now, State and federal governments channel tens of millions of dollars to the College Board 
making it in effect a government supported monopoly. As long as the College Board was an honest broker, eschewing ideological bias and leaving states, districts, and teachers enough flexibility to present their subjects as they wished, that made sense. It no longer does. The new Congress needs to see to it that its advanced placement testing subsidies are distributed in a way that encourages competition rather than preventing it. States need to consider authorizing the development of alternative AP tests that can compete with those developed by the College Board. It's time to wake up and realize that the Common Core has radically expanded his, its reach, capturing the entire spectrum of the curriculum, not in name, but in fact. It's time to bring the College Board's power grab into the center of the Common Core debate and restore local control and public accountability to America's system of education. Good afternoon. So, uh, one of the most influential books in social science in the past 50 years is a book called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. And it was published in 1970, and it was written by an economist named Albert Hirschman. Now, Hirschman's book discusses how individuals respond to a situation in which the services that they receive and that they rely on when these, those services are disintegrating, they're in decline, they're deteriorating. And Hirschman says, correctly in my view, that the two basic responses that we have, that we try to take advantage of, are exit and voice. Where exit means turning to a different provider or leaving the territory where that service is provided. And where voice means political participation. We often think, understandably, that these responses are stark alternatives. Hirschman, as a social scientist, wanted us to consider and wanted us to uh, understand the interplay between exit and voice. He said that the interconnection is more frequent and more important than mere conventional wisdom might have it. In our culture, we obviously have a role for political participation. We're a constitutional republic where power rests on the consent of the governed, where elections uh, elevate people to public office, and where elections also function as a way of legitimating the political system. Social scientists tell us about a lot of aspects of this. They tell about Arrow's theorem and the possibility of non-dictatorial lining up of voters' preferences. They tell us about agenda setting and log rolling. We, as men and women in the street, also uh, see that participatory democracy and deliberative democracy may be lovely in theory, but it's often dirty in practice. There are entrenched special interests. There are stacked decks, high barriers, influential established elites. Social scientists also affirm that it's very difficult to organize opposition to the current state of affairs when the uninvolved can free ride and reap the public benefits, if any, that organizers might gain. Likewise, in our culture, we have quite a few symbolic examples of the importance of exit. exit. We have the story of Exodus, of the ancient Israelites from the bondage of Pharaonic Egypt. We have the pilgrims and other religious refugees who left the old world for the new. We have pioneers who crossed from the Atlantic coast across the country to the frontier. We have farmers and industrial workers in the 19th century and early 20th century who went to Ellis Island in New York or Angel Island in San Francisco. We have blacks who moved from the south to the north both before and after slavery was ended. We have refugees and exiles from National Socialism and Communism. And as Hirschman himself noted, Political scientist Samuel E. Finer famously wrote a fine essay on how the absolutist states of Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries were obsessed with exit and how to block it, how to prevent it. Now, exit as a mechanism really has lower costs than voice has in the way of costs for an individual. But I want to add a limiting case that Hirschman 
stressed, and that is that exit, exit has higher costs for the individual when the individuals are loyal to the institutions. And that's where we get this third component in Hirschman's theory, exit voice and loyalty. So with exit, you can at lower cost than at the, through the long slog of politics, simply turn to a different provider or move to a different location, different place. Sometimes a place nearby, sometimes quite far away. Now loyalty, of course, can be strong in politics, but loyalty can also be lost. Think of the American Revolution and the breaking away of the United States from the British Empire. Now in the 1830s, when Alexis de Tocqueville visited America from France, he found Americans intensely loyal to the public schools and participating in them. These Americans in those days saw the public schools as extensions of their families and households. They viewed public schools, even though in those days public schools were often fee charging, they, they viewed these public schools as akin to voluntarily supported charities and a part of what social scientists today might call civil society. The public in those days saw public schools as something quite separate from distant political elites in faraway state and federal capitals. When Tocqueville described 19th century American society, he spoke of township school committees were deep, that were deeply rooted in their local communities. In those days, state control of local public education took the form of an annual report of the township committees to the state capital. There was no national control. Large sums, tax from laborers and farmers, were spent by these school committees, and their efforts reflected, Tocqueville thought, a widespread American desire to provide basic schooling as a route to opportunity and advancement. He admired the fact that self-activating America, in self-activating America, one might come across farmers who had not waited for official permission from above, but were putting aside their plows to deliberate on the project of a public school. Tocqueville feared that if ever Americans neglected their participation in associations or local governments like school committees, the tendency would go toward a loss of liberty and a surrender to what he called a soft despotism. Now today, many years after Tocqueville, public sentiment about the public schools still retains much of the feeling about the schools that people had back in Tocqueville's day. And the passion for local control is fueled by that feeling. But increasingly, parents and taxpayers view the public schools as part of an unresponsive, declining bureaucracy, carrying out edicts from distant capitals. We as a members of the public are faced with Hirschman's situation. That is to say, we are dealing with an institution that is supplying services which are perceived to be disintegrating. A social scientist like Hirschman would, would point out that we can make use, at such a time as this, of exit or voice or a combination of them to respond to the deteriorating situation. That is widespread ineffective instruction and to the declining institution, the public school itself. In this time of perceived inadequacy, Common Core came to the fore, precisely at a time when social scientists would say that civically active individuals care more than they usually do about exit voice and loyalty. But the Common Core designers have taken the existing bureaucracy and in, in public schooling and increased its centralization and uniformity. By creating the Common Core National Curriculum Content Standards in secret, behind closed doors, without public participation, the designers have increased alienation of the public from the schools as institutions that are worthy of loyalty. They are detaching people from loyalty to the public schools. The public had no voice in creating or adopting the Common Core. The other approach in times of a deteriorating public service is offering better exit options. 
This would lead to rejuvenation of schools, to inventiveness on the part of educational providers, to better service options for parents and children. But the strategy of the Common Core proponents is to create an almost inescapable national cartel. Now, there has long been a monopoly problem in education, in public school education, which was why economist Milton Friedman called for opportunity scholarships, also known as vouchers, to create a powerful exit option. But even in the absence of opportunity scholarships and charter schools, we had some exit options in the past because of competitive federalism. What uh, Ted Rebarber was talking about and was citing Michael Greve about. Competitive federalism is horizontal competition among jurisdictions. We know that it works in education because it has been studied at an interdistrict level. Economist Carolyn Hoxby studied metropolitan areas with many school districts like Boston and compared them with metropolitan districts that were all where all the schools were in one district, such as Miami or Los Angeles. She found that student performance is better in areas with competing multiple districts where parents at the same income level can move at the margins from one locality to another nearby in search of better education for their children. We have seen competitive federalism also work at the state level. Back in the 1950s, Mississippi and North Carolina were at the same low level. Over the years, North Carolina tried a number of educational experiments and moved well ahead of Mississippi. We have likewise seen Massachusetts move up over the years from mediocre to stellar, although under Common Core, Massachusetts is sinking back down again. Now, the goal of those who promote Common Core is to suppress competitive federalism. The Common Core curriculum framework and its rules are the governing rules of a cartel. The goal of Common Core designers and proponents ha has been a curricular design that would take over and supplant all state and local curriculums. They and their federal facilitators want a cartel that would override competitive federalism and shut down the curricular alternatives that federalism would allow. The federally funded national tests are there to police that cartel. All long-lasting cartels have to have a mechanism for policing and punishing those who are seen as shirkers and chiselers. And that is, in other words, the shirkers and the chiselers are those who want to escape the cartel's strictures and who want to increase the flexibility that they have so that they can succeed. Control of the College Board by one of the Common Core's chief designers has been used to corral Catholic schools, private schools, and homeschoolers into the cartel. The proponents of Common Core have now established a clearinghouse for authorized teaching materials to close any remaining possible avenue of escaping the cartel. Now, central to the rhetoric and rationale of the advocates of Common Core was the idea that state performance standards were already on a downward slide and that without nationalization, standards would inexorably continue on a race to the bottom. Now, charmingly enough, among conservatives and libertarians, there are slight nuances of differences among us. And we actually really, if we got together, we probably cobble a common factual view of this. And, but anyway, I would say something was perhaps a little bit I would say something perhaps a little different from Neil McCluskey, who said that competition among the states failed. And I would more inclined to agree with the wording that Mr. Rebarber used, where he said there was improvement in a number of the states, and that the gains were not as much as people hoped, okay? But he left out a part, which was there were gains, okay? So and there were gains nationally. The average nationally on NAEP showed gains, modest gains, not as much as people hoped. Okay. So, in fact, though, there was no race to the bottom in standards, in what was written in the standards. Indeed, one of the most prominent 
proponents of the Common Core and a pe person, the head of it, the past, immediate past head of it, Checker Finn, has said this in many things, that there is a race to the bottom that has been going on, okay? But this organization itself proved in its, in its booklet the proficiency illusion that that was not the case. Yes, they found. There are different standards in different states, which is what federalism means, okay? There's going to be different standards in different states. But there was no decline of everybody to the bottom. And we know from research in other areas like workplace safety and environmental standards and so forth, that this positive mechanism, this posited mechanism of a race to the bottom is not a natural and inexorable thing. In the case of education, think about it. Governors, state legislators, they don't want their state to have a reputation for having bad schools and an untrained workforce and no place you would want to move your executives and so forth. They want to have, they want to be named an education governor why they might become president of the United States if they had a reputation as an education governor. So yes, there's a possibility that people will do the least possible, okay? There's some aspects of human nature that might lead to that, but there are countervailing things that would pressure you to succeed, to do a good job. So. It wasn't the case that there was a race to the bottom. Do not say you are handing, you are accepting a false premise of the proponents of Common Core if you say that there was a race to the bottom going on before Common Core. It is not true. Don't, don't not use it just because it's their premise. Don't use it because it's not true. And you're handing, their, you're, you're handing them a sword if you admit that because it's, it's not true. Okay, so we have gotten rid of one, of one of the main pillars of all this. And I wanna conclude, because I've got more written down here than I can say in the time remaining. Why did they do this cartel? Well, they did it the way reason all people do cartels, to prevent competition, okay? So the head, the lead governor, back at this time where Common Core was being worked on, was Sonny Perdue. He was the governor, he was a Republican. He was the governor of, uh, but, but he was a technocratic type of Republican. So he was the governor of Georgia. And he didn't like people criticizing the students and the, the, of course the educators who, and the people like himself who were supervising the students, uh, criticizing the students of Georgia who were relatively well, low performing uh, for doing worse on tests that showed interstate comp uh, comparisons. Uh, he didn't like the fact that they were criticizing Georgia and they had different standards from Georgia. And so somebody like Massachusetts, let's say, well, of course they're doing better because they have higher more. So, hey, let's bring everybody to Georgia's level. <laughs> Some will go up because Georgia wasn't the very lowest in the country. Some will go up, but Massachusetts, Indiana, they will come down to Georgia's level as they should because we're Georgia. And you know what? They won't have to work as hard. This is the hidden thing for the people in Massachusetts and India. They won't have to work as hard. In fact, they're already ahead, so they can almost relax. And they form a cartel, and this way of competing, improving curriculum, is gone. It's off the table. They don't have to sweat that anymore, because everybody's stuck with the same thing. That's what they did. Now, the thing is, doing this created a blowback for him. And I'm going on too long, so I'm just gonna read right through this. They forgot that the desire for a voice, the desire for political action can become particularly intense when people are faced with the prospect of nowhere to exit to. They forgot that hemming in parents and teachers would create a demand for alternatives and escape routes. Alternatives to the national tests have arisen. States are dropping out of the national tests. States are also struggling to escape the common core cartel itself. Even the clearinghouse for teaching is sure to have serious problems. By trying to block exit and voice, the designers and the proponents of the Common Core have caused blowback. A large parent, teacher, and community-based movement has arisen to oppose the Common Core cartel and its policing mechanism, the national tests. Thank you. Great, thank you all. That is incredibly informative and I have so much to think about now on all of these issues. Great presentation. So we have um, 
about 10 minutes for questions. If, um, if you could just wait for the mic to come around. Yes, sir, in the middle. And after spending 33 years uh, in urban education, I walked in, and now I'm ready to go be a busker, I think, in the metro. Maybe all we did just didn't work out. Um, but maybe your answer uh, to this question can really inspire me to do something. Obviously, we have problems with the American education system. One of them that many of us do not think will work is the common core. Okay, we hear freedom, we hear choice. Just again, to sum up, if tomorrow, well, let's make it tonight. If tonight, President Obama dial, uh, dials you on your cell phone and makes you education super czar beyond any czar. First step, obviously it's not Common Core, first step to getting education in America back on track. And I will give you one out. Um, a lot of people believe we're kind of on a two-tiered system, uh, kind of the rich and the poor, the affluent, wealthy. So I mean, you, you can deal with that if, if, if you can't deal with one. If you want to give two solutions, fine. We're not. The, we're not the federal government. We're not going to impose limitations on you. But what really, where do you start? If it's not Common Core, where do you start? Uh, Ted, the first education super czar. <laughs> well, I think the, the I, I, I summarized a little bit of this. But I think the first step is to remove the federal straitjacket uh, with the strings in, tied to, to funding. Uh, you've got a mandate that you have a single curriculum and test in every state. You've got the, the financial strings and these waivers from requirements in No Child Left Behind that 100% of your students must be proficient, which is not true. But they're using these tools to push either Common Core, even before that, a single approach across the state. Um, I think the solution, I think, so the main thing the feds can do is get out of the way. Um, they also tie a lot of strings to special ed funding that causes enormous bureaucracy and doesn't benefit kids. Um, there are things that can be done there. Uh, and then I think uh, we need, as a, as, a, as a group and as educators and policymakers, to uh, have the states allow uh, more choice, more entrepreneurialism, uh, whether they're nonprofits, independent schools, or chains of for-profits, or whatever, uh, to create solutions, because solutions going to come. Uh, my closing point is solutions going to come to excellence to get excellence in the classroom. That solution is going to come at the organizational, institutional level. You build a school, a quality school, organically. You institutionalize it. You raise the quality of the teaching. You put in good leadership. You might have a system. You can try to do that in a system. That's the level where excellence happens, and we need to create the environment that supports the visionaries, educational visionaries, and, and entrepreneurs and managers that can do that. And that's what we need to do at the policy level, create that environment to support them. Any other perspective super czars want to weigh in on that? Real simple. The federal government has no purpose in education unless it's military and possibly uh, in, the, in the Indian tribes as well. And even then, I think it would be better left to the people there in the community. Before we had the Federal Department of Education involved in education, we had a 99% literacy rate, as it said in, in um, Democracy in America and Tocqueville's work. We had a system where it worked. When we look at how the scores have fallen since 1979, when the U.S. Department of Education became its own federal uh, department, I mean, you can see no success for the millions and the billions that we have thrown at education. Let, leave it to the states, uh, get, allow them to have less uh, supervision so they have to spend a huge amount of money on oversight and on bureaucracy, and you can put that into teachers and schools. I'll just say ditto, but I am contractually obligated by Cato never to take a super czar job. <laughs> so I can't do that. Okay, many super czars. can't do that either. No, no czar jobs at all, unfortunately. The one, the one thing, the one, the one area where the feds can do something is Washington, D.C., because mm -hmm. they are the sovereign authority. And one thing I did in a former life, I worked on the Hill in Congress for All, and I was the main staff author of the charter law for Washington, D.C., and we now have uh, almost half of the students in D.C. Uh, in charter schools. And these are really independent schools, uh, uh, although they're now being roped into all doing Common Core. Um, but, uh, but there are areas the feds can do it. And, and, and historically, the one area I would differ a little bit uh, here is that the, the feds have had a, a role in collecting education statistics, and that is valuable 
and a very limited and well-defined function. Stanley, any? No, we've, we've had enough super czars. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add, too, on uh, Ted's point, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, the voucher program here, um, if I were super czar, would be far more readily available. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm James. I'm an intern at Heritage Action. Um, so I've had some experience with Common Core tutoring my younger brother who's dealing with integrated math mm. now at the high school level. And I think that's one of the more serious adjustments made by Common Core. What's the pedagogical theory behind integrated math? And if that's not right, then the status quo ante, which I understand is discrete math, what's the pedagogical theory that makes that superior? Ted? Yeah, the, the um, all kinds of, uh, that's one of the, one's one of the areas where they, they try to innovate even more and, and uh, come up with a whole different approach. For those who don't know what, what he's talking about, at high school level in math, at least in the U.S., you've historically had algebra one, you've had geometry, algebra two, then, you know, those, so they don't like that in Common Core. <laughs> so they're, they're pushing this idea of integrated high school math, combining all these different things together. Um, the one model uh, uh, that where that's been tried uh, in, in the uh, Soviet Union failed uh, at a large scale, which is not to say the individual schools can't make this work, but there's no evidence that at a large scale this is going to be effective. And and so the the bottom line is simply look if if one uh, charter school or or school uh, district or whatever where parents could choose to go somewhere else wanted to try that. I would say, great, give it a try. If you think you can do it, parents want to buy into it, your teachers want to buy into it, wonderful. But it does not have a record at a large, sc a large scale of effectiveness, and, and it's just not right to impose that on everybody. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. You did an excellent job. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you're interested in rewatching this or sending it to your friends, this video will be archived in 24 hours. Thank you.